Hello, I'm Lisa Hansel, Editor-in-Chief of NAEYC's peer-reviewed journal, Young Children. I'd like to start by thanking all of the early childhood educators who have joined us for this webinar. We know you are very busy and we deeply appreciate that you're spending time with us. I'm excited to share that over a thousand people signed up for this webinar to deepen their knowledge of and to reflect on advancing equity in diverse classrooms. We are fortunate to have two well-known leaders with us today. Tyrone Howard is a professor of education in UCLA's Graduate School of Education and Information Studies and also the director of UCLA's Black Male Institute. Marie Sykes is the author of Doing the Right Thing for Children, Eight Qualities of Leadership, and he's also a senior associate with the Early Childhood Leadership Institute. After their presentations, we'll have time for questions. But before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping details. If you have questions you want to ask Tyrone and Maurice, please write them in the question box on the lower left side of your screen. They will answer as many questions as possible at the end of their presentations. Some people using a telephone line may experience a slight delay. You will have the best experience using the sound on your computer. All right, that's it. So um, we're ready to dive in. Tyrone, please get us started. Thank you so much, Lisa. I want to also thank everyone who has taken time out of what I know our very busy, hectic schedule to be part of this webinar. We think this is an important conversation, and the fact that you are here suggests that you would also agree with us that this is an important topic, and I'm glad to be a part of it. I'm also excited to hear uh, my colleague Maurice as well. But I want to talk about the way in which we have to think really differently about how we advance equity and how it needs to inform our classroom practice. And I, always, I want to preface the conversation by saying that I think about equity, and I hope we can start to think about equity in a very different way than we think about equality. Oftentimes, those two terms are used interchangeably as if they are one and the same. But I believe that equity operates from the standpoint of how do we give a little bit more to certain populations who have been historically and even contemporarily disadvantaged. So the idea of equity means that we're going to focus a spotlight on populations that have historically been on the margins, on the outside looking in, and begin to think about where our time, our effort, and our resources can be much more centered in equitable ways to help those who have been disadvantaged. So let's get into it. Uh, part of what drives this work, and I think that serves as the real catalyst for our conversation today, is that we must recognize that diversity is basically a heartbeat of the way of life in our United States of America. It is essentially our new normal. Uh, this is a trend that we have been seeing for some time, and it reached an apex in the fall of 2014 when we witnessed for the first time in our nation's history that the highest number of students who were enrolled in our K-12 schools were non-white. Demo demographers have been seeing this coming for some time, and actually the numbers happened sooner than we anticipated. Some demographers suggested that this would happen in the year 2017, 2018, but the fact that we hit this number four years earlier than anticipated speaks to the way in which we're seeing rapid ethnic, racial, cultural, and linguistic diversity in our schools. And so I oftentimes say that diversity is our new normal, that we as schools have got to respond to the changes of our student makeup, and the sooner we can begin to embrace, understand, respect, and recognize diversity, the better we will be. This reality is one that is not new on large urban cities across the country. Places like New York, Los Angeles, Houston, Texas, Miami, Florida, Chicago, Illinois, have seen these what are called majority-minority districts for a very long time. But now for the first time, what we're beginning to witness are large numbers of non-white students in some of the small middle parts of the country. States such as Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas are beginning to see larger numbers of non-white students in their schools. And so we must understand that this is a hallmark that suggests that we're not going back. We look at birth rates, we look at the numbers of children that individuals are having across the ethnic and racial lines, and we are seeing large numbers of Latino students. There are some estimates that suggest by the year 2030, Latinos will be our largest subgroup of students in our schools, surpassing whites, and we're going to continue to see a decrease in the number of white students who are in our schools. So again, it's imperative for our schools to help develop their teachers in a way that they can understand how to teach, talk, think and learn across diversity, because if we're going to stay true to our democratic ideals, 
We have to understand that diversity is our strength, diversity is our new normal, and it's a part of the fabric of, the night, of, of life in the United States. I also want to say that what we have to recognize is that while we embrace the fact that, or some of us, many of us, hopefully all of us, will embrace the new diversity that we see in our schools across the nation, there are some disturbing accounts that we have to come to grips with as well, that we continue to see these stubborn gaps in schooling experiences and outcomes between students of color. And I want to be clear, when I refer to students of color, I'm referring to African American, Native American, Latino, as well as Asian American students. Uh, and what we continue to see are some discrepancies in academic outcomes, namely with our African American, Latino, and Native American students compared to their white and certain Asian American counterparts. And that has oftentimes been referred to as the achievement gap. I guess what I would do, I would challenge that moniker a little bit because achievement suggests that these disparities are a result of students' individual efforts and what they've achieved. But I think we have to understand that in a much broader way. So I think a better, a better way to think about this is to understand the opportunity gaps that exist within our schools. And those opportunity gaps oftentimes have not been afforded to African American, Latino, Native American students in the same way that they have been for white and certain Asian American students. So when we understand those opportunity gaps, we're talking about access to high quality schools, access to highly prepared teachers, access to culturally engaging rich curriculum, access to AP and honors classrooms, and really at the level that we're concerned with, access to what we refer to as gifted and talented classes. So there's the issue of opportunity gaps where it comes to academic outcomes, but where one of the more disturbing realities has been in place has been when it comes to issues of diversity and discipline. And part of what we're seeing in schools across the country is that the greater the rates of ethnic and racial diversity are in schools, the higher rates of disciplinary action that's being taken. And if you look even on a more granular level, what we see is that the rates in which we see African-American and Latino children uh, in schools, the levels at which they are being suspended is quite disturbing and quite disproportionate in many districts and states across the country. I'm in a state in California where we know that at, as early as preschool, we're already seeing some troubling suspension rates. I've seen some reports that suggest that while African-American and Latino boys, for example, make up about 20, 25% of the preschool age population, that they make up over 50% of those students who are suspended and expelled. That should give us all some serious concerns, raise some pressing questions, and begin to lead us to think, what are we doing that we begin to see these students, namely black and brown students, being so woefully overrepresented when it comes to suspensions and expulsions? Now, I think a, a knee-jerk reaction is to say that, well, this happens because those are the students who are most disruptive in schools. Or another knee-jerk knee reaction might be, well, these are the students who cause the most troubles in schools, so they must be dealt with accordingly. I would challenge that, and I hope that we would all begin to challenge that by saying that some of these explanations need to be delved into a little bit deeper. And part of what I think happens is that there's oftentimes a disconnect that exists between many teachers and the students they teach, especially if those students are black or if they're African American or Latino. So cultural misunderstandings, are, I think, are part of this process. In some levels, you know, racial discrimination is part of the process. And oftentimes, implicit bias can all be part of the process of why we see large numbers of black and brown students being suspended. Now, some might say, well, well what do cultural misunderstandings have to do with what we're seeing in schools? I believe, and there's data to support this, I would recommend everyone take a look at William Gilliam's work where he looks at the levels at which black children were being targeted by teachers, looked at by teachers, scrutinized by teachers at a much higher rate than their white counterparts. I think we have to understand that when cultural misunderstandings play out, you have students of color who oftentimes bring their cultural ways of knowing and being to the classroom in a manner that is oftentimes not understood and typically misread by teachers. Teachers who think that students are being disruptive when students are oftentimes participating. Students who are oftentimes trying to find ways to understand content and engaging in ways that may be unfamiliar to some teachers. So again, cultural misunderstandings can be demonstrated by very well-intentioned teachers who just don't seem to understand the kind of cultural ways of knowing, the cultural ways of communicating, the cultural ways of being that many students bring into the classroom. So we should all be concerned in our districts, in our parishes, in our counties, in our states across the country to take a closer look at what is our data looking like when it comes to discipline, especially at the early childhood level, because what we have to be mindful of is that if we suspend a child one time, his or her likelihood of graduating from high school 
reduced about reduces about 25 percent and we don't want those labels to be placed on children at such an early age where it can have a devastating effect on the rest of their academic career so let's pay attention to issues around diversity and discipline because they matter and we have to make sure we're being fair we're being equitable we're being consistent and not having higher rates than we should across certain racial and ethnic categories so given that, I would ask us to think about three essential questions. And this is something that we all should think about, we should all talk about. Even if you're in a school district where students of color are not in the majority, I think these questions are still relevant because you may have small numbers of students of color. And I think you have to think about what is their experiences and how are we supporting all students regardless of their ethnic, racial, cultural backgrounds. So I think the first question we have to think about is given the increasing racial and ethnic diversity in the nation's schools, and in particular in early childhood programs in particular, what role should cultural relevance have in teaching practices and policy? And I would respond to that question by saying all of our teaching practices must be reflexive. We must be informed in ways that are centered around differentiation of students, despite the fact that we know that teachers frequently tend to teach in one particular domain. We're asking teachers now to rethink their ways of teaching, their ways of communicating, so that students across the ethnic and racial spectrum can understand ways in which they can uh, engage with the, the teaching and learning process. And I think we also have to begin to think about teacher education policy. What are the knowledge and skills that teachers must possess if they're going to enter this profession that shows that they can work with diverse learners? What are the knowledge and skills that teachers must possess if they're going to enter this profession if they're going to work with language learners? What are the knowledge and skills that teachers need to have if they're going to show that they're working with immigrant populations? These are some really important questions that we all need to respond to across our states, across our cities and counties to ensure that as we think about the process of becoming teachers, that that process is consistent with who those students are that teachers will be teaching. A second question that we have to think about is what are, the, what are the essential knowledge and skills that early childhood educators need for teaching today's diverse learners? I think that's the, the million dollar question. What are those skills? And I think one of the ways we have to understand that is by knowing race and knowing culture, to know that race and culture are really complex concepts that shape so much of what students know and understand, even at early ages. There's studies that show that young children are able to pick up on racial differences as early as two years old. They know that racial differences exist. The challenge becomes that we as adults frequently don't engage students in those conversations about racial differences. You might say, well, how do I engage my students if they're three or four or five years old around racial differences? I think it can look different. It can sound different. But the key is to talk to students, listen to students. Make sure if you hear them saying things that are destructive or that are dismissive of certain ethnic and racial groups that that's not tolerated. And I think the main thing we can't do is ignore these issues because to ignore them is to say that these issues don't exist or they don't matter. And I would ask all educators to begin to challenge this notion of a colorblind approach to how they see students. Colorblindness basically tells students that their diversity doesn't matter, their race is unimportant, and their identities are not seen. So I would ask teachers to think about how we begin to think about race but also understand that culture matters as well. Culture shapes who we are, how we think, how we speak, how we communicate, how we interpret the world around us, how we shape our core values. Essentially, we are all cultural beings, and we have to begin to ask ourselves as educators, what are my cultural ways of knowing, and how do those cultural ways of knowing shape the way that my students see the world around them? And then the third and final question I think we should be asking is how are the learning prospects compromised for diverse learners when educators do not understand them culturally? Uh, I'm going to give an example in a few minutes about that, but I think we have to come to the understanding that in many ways that for students whose ways of knowing are not oftentimes recognized, that they become at a severe disadvantage because oftentimes they're expected to know and understand how teachers see the world, how teachers communicate, how teachers want emotion to be expressed, how teachers want reading or thinking or mathematical reading to be expressed. And oftentimes that may look a little different than the way that students come to understand how these issues are playing out. So I hope that each of us will begin to ask these questions and others as we begin to think deeper and harder about the ways in which diversity plays out in our classroom practices. I would also ask us to understand that every student, and I do mean every student, possesses her or his own cultural capital. Essentially what I'm referring to here are different ways of doing, knowing, communicating, and living. And understand this, and this is an important point that we all must recognize it. Just because students are different doesn't mean that they're deficient. Just because they're different doesn't mean that they're deviant. And just because they're different, different doesn't mean that they're 
defiant or despondent. We have to make sure that we understand and we give some space and place in our classrooms for students to express themselves in ways that we may not be accustomed to, to interact with students in ways that we oftentimes may not see certain students using in the classroom. Difference is our key term here. We have to recognize that we have lots of ways of communicating, seeing, exploring the world. Diversity is part of our normal reality, and let's begin to let students show how their different types of cultural capital play out. Now what I would like to do is give a few examples of the types of cultural capital that I think we must be aware of as we think about this work. And one of the examples that I typically use with the teacher education students that I work with are developed by education scholar Tara Yoso. And Yoso talks about cultural capital wealth or cultural community wealth. And really she talks about six types of capital that many students of color possess as they engage in the thinking and learning process that I think can be a wonderful example of how this plays itself out. One of those is aspirational capital. And what he also describes here is this way in which young students of color oftentimes desire and aspire to impress their teachers and want to do well to impress their, their parents. So even students who may come from a low-income background, there's still hopes and dreams and aspirations that even our youngest learners have. And there must be a space and a place for those young people to talk about their ideas, to express their imaginative thoughts, and to begin to really understand the way that they see, hear, and understand a world around them that they see is full of possibilities and full of hope, and they may not always look the way we think they should look, but we still must affirm that aspiration when it's manifested. A second one is linguistic capital, and this is one that's, I think, quite common, that students of color bring to the classroom every single day, diverse ways of speaking, diverse ways of communicating, and sometimes these linguistic forms of, of expression are not always in line with what teachers think are the most ideal ways. One example I frequently give is, Many years ago, I talk about my, my, my son, who was in preschool at the time, coming home every single day with small paintings and pictures that he had done in his pre-K classroom. And I became curious about why he wasn't coming home with more of the academic types of work that I saw from his white and Asian peers coming home with that had numbers and letters in them. I remember his teacher, who was a white woman who I liked a lot, explaining to me that she didn't think my son was quite ready to do some of the more academically demanding tasks yet. Well, I asked him, well, how do you know or what suggests that, you, that he doesn't know how to do this work? And she responded by saying, well, I frequently ask him and encourage him to participate in our activities, and he tells me that he doesn't want to participate. She says, I always invite him to our circle time. We read our story of the day, but he says he doesn't want to do those things. I'd explained to her that his linguistic capital was such that when she asked him or she invited him or she encouraged him, in his four-year-old mind, that meant that he did not have to do it. I proceeded to explain to her that for him, I think what worked best was a more directed form of communication where she told him to come sit down instead of asking him, where she told him she needs him to sit down instead of encouraging him. I had explained when we're at home, we don't ask him if he would like to go to bed. We don't encourage him to come sit down at dinner. It's a very direct form of communication. That's a form of linguistic capital that some students possess that teachers need to be mindful of. Other types of capital that oftentimes get manifested, familiar capital and social capital, these are other ways that children of color are oftentimes expressing themselves and being full learners in the classroom that we must understand. And I would also say that resistance capital as well is a form of capital that many students can oftentimes manifest, especially in the face of injustice. Some students feel like if they see something that's happening where a student, a peer is being wrong, that it's their role or their responsibility to speak up and speak out on behalf of their peers. Some might think, well, if I'm a teacher, this is not involving this student, but some students come from a home life and a background or environment where issues around injustice are not tolerated. They speak up, they speak out, and they defend the honor of that, that individual who they may feel is receiving the injustice. And so these are some examples of, of how capital situated with culture manifests itself and how students begin to see the world around them. Another one is social capital. Again, it's important for us as teachers to listen and learn to our, from our students because they are showing their cultural ways of knowing every single day. I think we must engage these circles where we have students talk, think, share, listen, express, and that's how you begin to pick up on how student culture is a part of who they are. And then on this final slide that I'd like to talk about before I prepare to transition is that I think we have to understand that many students see culture manifesting from the standpoint of being what is referred to as my brother's keeper. Again, this is around issues of justice and fairness and equality in a classroom. 
not uncommon to find students of color who will, who will see injustice, who will speak up about it, who will speak out against it and say that that's not fair, that's not right. If my peer or my classmate is not going to be able to play because he did something that was helping me, then I'm also going to be in trouble as well. I mentioned the fact that there are directives that are disguised, disguised as questions. That I shared earlier this whole idea of how we as educators communicate with students to make sure that for our early childhood students that we are making sure that we are clear about what we want them to do, what we need them to do, and not suggesting or recommending or asking that they do things in ways that might be misinterpreted differently than how we want them to understand. And then the whole idea I mentioned of resistance I think is so crucial because, again, sometimes resistance, while it might be seen through a negative lens of students being defiant, it can also be understand, understood as students standing up for something that they believe in. So these are just some small examples of how we must begin to understand that culture matters. I think we all have to become educational anthropologists. We have to talk to parents. We have to talk to caregivers. And most importantly, we have to observe and listen to our students as they interact in their circles with their peers because in those environments, in those interactions, and in those settings, we can learn some amazing things about how young people see the world around them, how they engage, how they, how they converse, and how we can then use that knowledge as a way to bridge the gap to the content that we would like for them to learn in our classrooms. With that, I will pass the microphone to my colleague, Maurice Sykes. All right. Well, thank you, Tyrone. We'll get to Maurice in just a second. I just wanted to uh, jump in here to say that that was a really, really interesting and um, informative presentation. You've given us a lot to think about, and um, it fits so nicely with NAEYC's um, emphasis for so many years now on intentional teaching and uh, anti-bias education. So thanks again. Um, I'm sure many of our audience members would like to learn more. Fortunately, both Tyrone and Maurice contributed to the May 2018 issue of Young Children, which was a special issue focused on the power of early childhood education to help equalize opportunities for children. And uh, stick around to the end, and we will provide that website for that issue. Um, but now, let's uh, no more delay. Maurice, please jump in. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Tyrone, for laying the foundation for my comments on advancing equity and learning in diverse classrooms. Point of fact is it was Tyrone's article on cultural capital in young children that prompted my thinking about teacher cultural capital. I was reminded of the teacher preparation program that I participated in during the late 60s, where we were trained and expected to develop the competencies of a teacher as ethnographer, who held the equity proposition that all children can learn at high levels, and that the cultural capital and agency that children from under-resourced communities brought to the teaching and learning dynamic was worth knowing, understanding, valuing and exploiting in the best sense of the word. A teacher ethnographer who through inquiry, inquiry and self-reflection would focus on their own cultural capital and its influence and contribution to the teaching and learning dynamic. Therefore, I find it most distressing that almost 50 years later, we are still challenged by the equity proposition as represented by the same achievement gap that existed in the late 60s. The only difference being that we know and understand that the achievement gap, or as Tyrone suggests, the opportunity gap, is real, it starts early, it's persistent, and it's reversible. We should take to heart the prophetic words of the influential educational researcher, Ron Edmonds, who in 1979 set forth a simple proposition that flatly challenged the prevailing assumptions regarding the achievement gap in equity. He said, and I quote, we can, whenever and wherever we choose, successfully teach all children whose schooling is of interest to us. We already know more than we need to know to do that. Whether or not we do it must finally depend on how we feel about the fact that we have it so far. Critical pedagogy. 
Ron Edmonds' challenge to the educational community is consistent with the concept of teacher as ethnographer, which finds its roots in the critical pedagogy movement, a progressive philosophy that challenges teachers and students to examine power structures and patterns of injustice and inequality. It requires teachers to facilitate active, social, cognitive, and affective student-centered learning. These teachers provide democratically focused learning scenarios and experiences characterized by exploration and inquiry within a caring community where children have choices and voices regarding curriculum, problem solving, and decision making. The principles of critical pedagogy are organized around a schema that places critical pedagogy at the center surrounded by three interconnected circles, namely curiosity, create, creative learners and creative experiences, and voice and authentic dialogue. Curiosity, one of the quotes, quotes popularly attributed to Einstein says, quote, free curiosity has greater power to stimulate learning than rigorous coercion. And the coercion of um, having children not be curious is detrimental to their development. Curiosity could be defined as a deep and persistent desire to know and understand. It drives meaningful learning and thinking by prompting proactive and intentional behaviors and activities that are novel, complex, and ambiguous. Oftentimes we want to focus on the right answer rather than leaving possibilities open to children that stimulates their curiosity. The pedagogy of curiosity, or what I call the curious classroom, is based on a how-to-know perspective. The pedagogy of curiosity requires the teacher to create an environment of active, curious engagement characterized by three dimensions. One, active participation, active thinking, active question, and focused collaboration. Two, students talking and taking ownership and reflecting upon learning experiences individually and in groups. And three, utilizing inquiry-based strategies in critical thinking as a means to build knowledge and understanding. The teacher takes on the role of coach, facilitator, as we like to say, the guide on the side instead of the sage on the stage. They use and model techniques that help children to see what thinking, questioning techniques look like. And they are always willing to confront issues of social injustice and equity. On the same scheme of there's creative learners and creative spaces, key features of creative learners and creative spaces is seen as a product of the dynamic interplay between the teacher's personal qualities, the pedagogy he or she adopts, and the classroom ethos they choose to create. To accomplish this, teachers need to do the following. One, deepen their knowledge of theory and practice relative to creative teachers and creative teaching, looking in on teachers who are considered to be creative. Two, consider their own personal qualities and emerging pedagogical practice in relationship to creativity. And three, reflect upon specific features of their environment that provides for creative pedagogy. And the third dimension is voices of authentic dialogues. To promote voices of authentic dialogues, teachers must demonstrate courage and a commitment to civic and social engagement and responsibility that will ignite bravery in young children to realize that they have the power and agency to change the status quo. The concept of co-construction, reflection, and feedback loops are all critical elements of creating a culture where authentic conversations can occur. They can occur by, one, engaging children in the process of establishing classroom rules and logical consequences, teaching and practice, two, teaching and practice practicing active listening, questioning, and feedback techniques, and three, conducting classroom meetings at the beginning an end of each day that focus on civic engagement and issues related to social justice and equity. It all starts with what Laura Smalaguzzi, founder of the world-renowned early childhood 
programs in Reggio Emilia, Italy, called The Vision of the Child. He said, and I quote, our image of the child is rich in potential, strong, powerful, competent, and most of all, connected to adults and other children. He further stated that teachers' image of the child is where teaching and learning begins. Therefore, believing in the power of the child as a capable, competent, resourceful learner is where advancing equity and learning in diverse classrooms begin. And it is also the first dimension of cultural capital that the early childhood professionals should bring to the teaching and learning process. This image of the child requires the capacity to see children not by their skin color, surname, gender, home language, zip code, or disability, but rather by the promise and possibilities that resides in each child's hopes, dreams, aspirations, and unrealized potential. The second dimension of teachers' cultural capital is the capacity to understand the importance of quality relationships, the ability to establish authentic relationships by taking a personal interest in each child and conveying to them that they are valued and respected for their cultural agency and that their experiences outside of the classroom are equally as important as their experiences inside the classroom. The third dimension of the teacher's cultural capital is the capacity to understand the importance of quality conversations, the ability to engage children in sincere, meaningful, reciprocal conversations with the appropriate balance of back and forth dialogue that models, models classroom discourse deepens concept development and builds vocabulary and promotes accountable talk. And by accountable talk, I mean asking children sort of the reasons for what they're saying, not just saying, oh, that's a good response, but why do you think like that? What prompted you to respond that way? So the fourth dimension of teachers' cultural capital is the capacity to understand the quality of experiences the ability to design and implement a dynamic, robust classroom, a program that is rich in print and conversations, conversations that are intellectually stimulating and where there are a wide range of hands-on, minds-on learning opportunities that build the knowledge and skills that lead to success in school and in life. The concept of teacher as ethnographer, coupled with Edmund's admonition and the four dimensions of teacher cultural capital could serve to advance our efforts to advance equity in learning in diverse classrooms. Thank you. Great. Maurice, thank you so much. That was uh, definitely very thought-provoking, and um, we've got a lot of terrific questions coming in. So um, many thanks to Tyrone and to Maurice. Uh, audience members, we've got a good 20 minutes here for Q&A, so keep those questions coming in. Um, we already have enough that I'm going to do a little bit of merging and uh, digesting here to get us started. So um, fair warning to Tyrone and Maurice, this question in slightly different formats is coming to both of you. Um, so Tyrone mentioned that um, being colorblind is not very uh, productive, and Maurice, you have discussed seeing each child's individual strengths. So I'm going to ask each of you to talk a little bit more about that, and um, specifically to address, you know, if children have, and particularly, you know, young children, three, four, five-year-olds have questions about um, racial or cultural issues or, you know, if there are negative experiences in the classroom, how should teachers um, address racial and cultural issues? Uh, so, Maurice, I will start with you on that. Well, I think, um, and to Tyrone's point earlier, what we shouldn't be is afraid of talking about race and differences. And, um, you know, we start our year out, and we're at the beginning of the school year, talking, I mean, one of the favorite themes is all about me uh, and or going to school. So I, I think that it is the teacher's responsibility to surface we're all alike and we're all different in many ways. And so I, 
I just want to underscore the point of our, you know, when people say they don't see color, that is disturbing because if you have children in your classroom and you know them individually, you should know much about them. So this whole idea of establishing meaningful relationships and valuing, respecting children, that also means understanding their race and their ethnicity and their home language and their home culture. So it's all a part of that package. Okay, great. Tyrone, did you like to add in there? No, I think Maurice said it eloquently. I don't know I could say, say it much better. I think it comes down to the idea of knowing who students are in totality, and race and ethnicity is a part of who students are. And I think what we also have to understand, for many teachers saying that they don't see color at the same time that certain students, namely students of color, are getting fewer opportunities to learn is an inherent contradiction. And that's where issues of implicit bias come into play. And so the only way that implicit bias or unconscious bias can be disrupted is if teachers start to think and talk about racial differences. Students are curious, and I think what we have to do is we have to honor their curiosity. And we need to tell students, yes, there are people who have different skin tones. There are students who have different eye color. There are students who have different hair color. That's what, that's what makes us unique. I don't think we become fixated on it, but we at least acknowledge it, and we talk about it, and we move on. I think what we do oftentimes is we send a very, a very strong message to students, this is taboo. Don't talk about it. Don't mention it. Don't think about it. And I think then young children become older adults who then operate with that same standpoint of racist taboo, Race is something we don't talk about. And then I think what happens and what's really destructive and dangerous is that the less we know, the more we tend to make up. I'm also interested um, in children's theories about how they see differences. And so when children point out, you know, he's different or that child's color, I often ask children, so why do you think that is? I mean, so this whole notion of construction, because what we do know about children is that they are forming the world based on their construction of what they see the world to be and pushing children to think more deeply about why they think someone is different. And I'm not talking about assigning a value. So how do you think, why do you think his eyes are blue or why do you think his skin is brown? Just pushes children to think more deeply about what it is they are perceiving. And this is where accountable talk comes in, pushing children to go beyond the surface. All right, great, thank you. Um, so Tyrone, I'm gonna come back to you and I'm gonna combine a couple of questions from audience members. Um, one is for you to talk a little bit more about implicit bias and um, contrast that with explicit bias. You had mentioned implicit bias earlier and I think we could use a little clarification on um, just what that is. And then also, if you could go back to Walter Gilliam's uh, research on suspensions and expulsions and explain that in a little bit more detail, that'll address several of the questions that have come in. Yeah, so if we can start with the issue of implicit bias, I think it's important to read the work of several folks. Daryl Wing Sue, S-U-E, has written about this extensively. So has Daniel Solorsano, uh, who has written about this. And basically what they've talked about is the idea that we are all biased in some way, shape, or form, because any society that socializes people through media, through popular press, sends messages, some good, some not so good, some positive, some not so positive. And so what these scholars talk about is that it's important for teachers to think about their implicit or unconscious biases. These are biases that we all have. They oftentimes inform our behaviors and inform our actions more than we recognize. And what we have to be mindful of is that those actions and those uh, sort of implicit beliefs that we all have are in the back of our minds. If they're anti-black or anti-brown and we're in a classroom with black or brown students, we may find ourselves in situations where the black and brown children are really called upon or we're more likely to keep our eyes on the black and brown children waiting for them to be disruptive, or we tend to give praise to the white children, but we don't give the same kind of praise to the black or brown children. And again, you can be a very fair-minded individual who thinks that she or he treats all children the same, but then students feel like they're not given the same opportunity to be part of the learning process. One of the ways that folks can begin to check their own biases. I oftentimes refer many of my teachers and my pre-service teachers frequently do this as well. We go to the implicit association test that's put out by Harvard University. 
You can go online. You can Google it, the IAT, which stands for Implicit Association Test, and you can see how in a 10, 15-minute time frame you get asked certain questions, and it can show an anti or pro bias or non-bias towards a certain group or a certain skin color. And I think that's important. Many teachers take it, and they don't like their results, and they get upset, and they say the instrument is flawed. Then I say, well, why don't you take it again? And they take it again, and the results come back even worse than the first time. But it just shows you that having biases doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you a human being because we all have them, present company included. And that really feeds into the idea around Gilliam's work because what Gilliam found in his work is this idea that many of the teachers that he studied in early childhood education tend to have more of a watchful eye, suspicious eye on black and brown children, namely black children, wherein they engaged in similar behaviors as white students, but teachers were more likely to discipline or redirect the behavior, same behavior, mind you, of black children and black, brown children that was oftentimes shown by white children. Now, some folks might say that's just coincidental, but when it happens consistently and over time, it suggests that there's a larger issue, a larger pattern, perhaps a larger problem that needs to be addressed. And so Gilliam's work is important. It just shows how at early ages young children are given certain messages. Not only are the children of color receiving messages about themselves being seen as being problematic, but also their peers, their white peers, their Asian peers, also can pick up on these cues that the teacher is giving and saying, wow, if this student is being seen to, talked to, looked at as a problem by the teacher, then maybe we as peers should also see that child as a problem too. And that can affect peer-to-peer -peer relationships and really begin to affect the child's self-esteem and sense of belonging in a classroom. Okay, thank you very much. I think that uh, clarifies several issues. Um, so now we've gotten several questions uh, that, Maurice, I think these are going to be for you, um, related to just exactly how you engage young children in um, authentic dialogue about social justice. And we even have a question here um, that I think would probably be pretty common across a lot of uh, preschool and kindergarten classrooms saying that, well, you know, we do read alouds about Rosa Park and Martin Luther King Jr. And um, is that what you mean in terms of, you know, fostering discussions of social justice? Or um, do you have something else in mind or something in addition, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Well, I think any good literature is worth reading aloud. Um, you know, I think about, you know, how we contextualize even these people that we're putting in front of children, be it Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, or Cesar Chavez, or anyone else. But I do think there are real experiences in the classroom that lend themselves to discussions of social justice. One that comes to mind, and, you know, it is, you know, the block corner pretty much is the domain of the boys. And dramatic play is pretty much the domain of the girls. Teachers often say, well, that's not the case in my classroom. But if you ask the children who plays in the block corner, they will typically tell you the boys and who's in dramatic play. So here is, it is both, it is an issue of social justice because the boys typically dominate the block corner. And I've been in classrooms where the boys will say to the girls, what are you doing over here? You know, and the girls will say to the boys when they come in, you're not supposed to be here. And so it is also role definition, but role definition is an issue of social justice. And so a teacher should have, I mean, I had one teacher who one afternoon, she went in the block corner with the girls, girls only, just to let the girls know that they could be in the block corner. She had on a hard hat, and it was only for the – but it's also a discussion. You know, I notice when we have choice time that the boys – who's in the block corner for the most part, I would ask the children. They would say, well, the boys. is, And then we start talking about what is right and fair and just. So it's being comfortable, and I go back to Tyrone's notion of our own inherent biases. See – some teachers might believe that the boys should dominate the block corner and the girls should dominate. So if that's your belief system, but now you're getting into gender bias and you're creating a whole set of other problems. And so it's in the natural ebb and flow of the classroom that presents opportunities for justice. What is right? What is fair? Not right and wrong, but what is right, just, fair, fair and equitable. Great. Thank you. Um, so we've gotten a couple of questions related to 
how to engage families. So once again, um, Tyrone and Maurice, I'm going to point this one at both of you. Um, we had one question in particular that was um, a little bit more general, but um, it's from a student teacher, and we're always very thrilled to have students with us. Um, so, but it's asking about how to strike this balance of getting families involved but not pressuring families. Um, so I'm going to summarize that as how to be welcoming and particularly how to be welcoming cross-culturally. Uh, and then there was another question earlier that was related to specifically an issue of when you don't speak the family's language, um, how to address some of those barriers, and um, it strikes me that perhaps the two of you could talk about um, taking an interest in the family's culture as being a way to start to build a bridge, even if the language part of the communication is a struggle. So, Tyrone, why don't we start with you, and then Maurice will have you jump in. So, yeah, families need to be a part of the solution, even though it pains me to say in some cases families can be part of the challenge as well. And by that, what I mean is that children typically come with some of the similar attitudes and beliefs around difference that they've learned from home. Issues of discrimination and prejudice and racism are not inherently a part of who we are. They're learned. And just as they're learned, they can be unlearned. So we like to think that parents and caregivers can be part of that solution. So I think cultural differences can be a way to help bridge those those gaps. And I think that if we begin to have parents who are from different cultural backgrounds share some of their customs, share some of their traditions, share some of their ways of expression as part of the way that we create what I refer to as cultural democracies in our classrooms where students get to learn and hear from families and children who come from other parts of the world. They begin to understand some of their holidays. They begin to understand some of their core beliefs. They begin to understand some of the traditions and some of the oral histories that are told. I think this is where all of our students benefit. The students from those communities that are oftentimes new to a school setting get to share some of their understandings. But at the same time, U.S.-born children who are not familiar with those cultures may begin to broaden their understanding. And I think the earlier that we can start to shape those beliefs and begin to create the sense of uh, respect and value and appreciation of diversity and culture in young children, the better they are to be in situations where they don't adopt prejudice attitudes, they don't have discriminatory behaviors, and they don't have negative racial attitudes. So, yes, families, engaging families about sharing some of their ideas, some of their input, some of their beliefs can be a big, 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 big uh, uh, avenue. But I also will offer this caveat. Some pa parents and families don't want to talk about these issues, so I don't want to make this sound like it's an easy win because you will find some parents and some families of color who will say that's not something that we're interested in doing, and if that's the case, I think it's important for teachers to respect that. So, you know, when we talk about family engagement, I always say, what do we want to engage them for? Why do we want them to be involved in the work of the program or the school? So, you know, it, it does something that's common across all cultures. <clears throat> program schools to before we even start the school year or early in the year to have a conversation with families about your plans for the year. And I think one thing that, and if you don't have the language, we need to find someone who does have the language to translate, but I think that first impressions are lasting. And I encourage teachers and directors and principals to follow this framework. You talk to parents and you say, I will be your child's teacher this year. You know much more about your child than I do. Tell me your hopes and dreams for your child this year. That is so disarming. I mean, because you have validated the parent and the family from the beginning. And then you go on and talk to them about your hopes and dreams for the child. And so that initial contact, the contract, of you know more, we're going to work together, you know more. I mean, that, when you have challenges down the road, that helps to mediate many of them. And I think the other thing is that we have to be careful with holidays and food because we can fall into stereotypes. And I've seen some people do awful things um, with trying to celebrate cultures. And, you know, there's something on the um, 
enters and enters that looks for cultural competence, and I see little girls with wooden shoes. Children in Holland do not wear wooden shoes. And so I think that people have to pay a lot of attention, and I certainly uh, recommend that we read Louise German Sparks' anti-bias curriculum and um, some of the work that people from Teaching for Change have put out in terms of that kind of thing. Okay, great. Uh, so, Maurice, another question for you here. Uh, this is from an early childhood educator, so I'm just going to read it word for word. It says, uh, in the children's book, The Other Side, a black girl is excluded from play because of the color of her skin. It's resolved in the end, and the children do play together. Is this a good springboard for conversation, or is it introducing racism? <laughs> Well, you know, I would use that book because I observed some discriminatory practice in the classroom. You know, it's sort of like, we all know young children can be very unkind to one another. And, you know, so it is thinking from a social justice perspective and paying attention to the dynamics of the classroom. And so I would use that, but I wouldn't teach you, read that book in isolation. I would read it in the context of kind gestures and how do we show our friends that we value them and we care about. So if we're creating a sense of caring and we could ask the question, do you know any examples and what does it mean to be fair? Children have their own definition. What does it mean to be just? What is justice? And if children don't know, I would teach them the definition because Bruner made it very clear. We can teach children any concept that we need to on their own level. And get this vocabulary up there and this beginning emerging concept development. And then I would read books where children did wonderful things for other children and where children did not so wonderful things. But it's not in isolation. And when you read a book like that in isolation, you can get a lot of trouble from parents because they say, my child came home and said, and if you don't have a strong theoretical <laughs> conceptual framework for what you're doing. So I say in isolation, no. Within a larger um, random acts of kindness kind of thematic, yes. Okay, great. So we only have um, a few minutes to go. So I'm going to do one last question for both of our presenters, and I'm going to ask them to um, tackle a huge topic in a very brief way, which is I'm going to come back to the very beginning where Tyrone mentioned um, this concept of the opportunity gap. And um, Tyrone specifically mentioned several aspects of opportunity gaps related to education. And uh, I just wanted to wrap this up by having both of you reorient us to the larger concept here and talk just briefly about some of the broader economic, historical, and societal gaps that are driving a lot of those educational issues and um, think about the extent to which these very important topics that we're tackling are really should be resting on the shoulders of educators alone or if they should be resting on all of our shoulders. So, um, Tyrone, why don't you take that first, but you only get about a minute and a half. That's not, that's not fair, Lisa. You can't ask that hard question with a minute and a half, but I appreciate it. So here goes. Yes, yeah, this is a topic that rests on all of our shoulders because, really, it gets to the heart of who we say we are as a nation. We say that we value democracy, we value fairness, we value justice, we value opportunity. And we, for years, have not always measured up to those lofty principles and we were able to somehow dismiss the so-called minorities of this society because they were just that minorities. But now we're living at a time where the minorities are becoming majorities. And I think we really have to then double down on our efforts to ask hard questions about who are we as a society if we believe in democracy, fairness, justice, opportunity, but yet our largest and soon-to-be largest populations continue to be on the outside looking in. So what we're asking educators to do is not something that's only relegated to education. We're also asking our larger society to take a long, hard look at how we think about issues around opportunity, equity, race, racism, discrimination, because we cannot thrive as a society if we continue to marginalize large segments of our population. One of the models that we operate on as a nation is e pluribus unum, which means out of many comes one. 
And we have to be frank that if we're going to be one, we have to recognize the many. And that becomes, to me, the real civil rights issue of the 21st century. And just to pick up on that, you know, it does, I'm going back, Tyrone, to your opportunity gap issue. And so here's the deal. Children from under-resourced communities, children of color, poor children are less likely to be in high-quality programs. They reflect, in many instances, the K-12 world, where poor children get the least prepared teachers with the least experience. And so the opportunity to be in a dynamic, robust, uh, challenging uh, environment just doesn't Children are stalled from the start. I would recommend to people to look at the um, documentary Age 7 in America, which is Meryl Streep is the narrator. It's old. It's based on a documentary that was done in England. But you can see at age 7 the disparity of opportunity for children. It shows a cross-section of children ethnically and economically, and you see how this starts. So our challenge is to have higher quality programs and particularly. See, we all say that children, poor children benefit from quality programs, but we don't have enough high quality programs for the children to benefit from. Okay. Well, um, Tyrone and Maurice, uh, this has been a really thought provoking and um, for me personally, just an invigorating call to action. And you've brought a lot of clarity to some hugely important issues here. And once again, I want to say thank you to all of the early childhood educators who gave us their time today. Uh, we know how valuable it is. We really do appreciate it. Um, as with other NAEYC webinars, this one will be available online. So um, with that, once again, thank you to the audience members. Thank you, Tyrone and Maurice. And um, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Maurice, and thank you, everyone who was a part of this. Thank I you, Tyrone, it. and thank you, Lisa.